tracking uh, at uh, 10,142. The day low is 10,141. Market is still down, <clears throat> but down less than 1%. So we have seen some sight of recovery. Sun Pharma as well down about 5%. UPL was down, GSW still down 2%. On the way up, HDFC up about 2%. Other financials like India was uh, housing. Markets fall for the fourth straight session due to weak global queues. Nifty loses a percent and Sensex sheds 300 points. But the fall in crude oil prices cap losses and helps India outperform most Asian markets. Indusind Bank's Ramesh Sopti tells the NBC TV 18 that the bank has taken total provisions of 350 crores and Ireland FS and resolution will bring in definitive cash flows. Private sector banks see extensive buying as investors move to safety. Paint stocks lose colour. Asian paints hits a seven-month low after a top-down miss in the second quarter numbers. Kanza and Erulak Burger paints also drop in tandem. Pharma and IT stocks slump as the rupee remains largely steady. Both the indices lose nearly 3%, led by Sun Pharma, Lupin, Wipro and Infosys. And in results, Bajaj Finance and RBL Bank recover in trade after reporting a healthy set of second quarter numbers. TVS Motors beats street expectation. HCL Tech meets expectation in their second quarter numbers. Well, those were the top five headlines from Dalal Street. Hello and welcome to Markets Today Talk Back, the show where we tell you all that happened in those six hours of trading in five headlines. I'm Lata Venkatesh with me, my colleague Ekta Batra. Hi, Ekta. Hi, Lata. Yes, absolutely. Over the next 30 minutes, we will be talking about those top five market stories. Our guests today are Sanjeev Basin and Mitesh Thakkar, who will be answering all of your stock queries on the fundamentals and technicals. And we will also be talking to Richard Harris of Port Shelter Investment Management. But before we get to all of our guests, uh, well, Lata, it turned out to be a very volatile day today. Volatile and largely lower. Uh, the uh, Signs were all to see in the global markets. Uh, we had uh, Asian markets losing three percentage points a piece when they looked at Nikkei or Hang Seng or uh, Shanghai. Basically, the Chinese indices lost everything, almost everything that they gained yesterday after that uh, uh, boost they got, uh, liquidity boost given to the economy. And uh, this was followed up in Europe as well with a fair set of... Uh, Similar and more worries. I mean, the tariff wars and the rate hikes uh, bringing growth down and separately geopolitical issues possibly because of uh, the murder of, uh, uh, of the journalist uh, Khashoggi as well as uh, uh, worries about, say, Italian budget, Brexit. I mean, uh, the point is there was a risk off across the world. That brought crude down and because of that, probably because of that, the Indian fall was not as resounding as some of the other Asian indices. Uh, and also, of course, we have had a fair amount of fall in the last three, four days when perhaps Asian markets didn't fall so much. Uh, uh, there was the odd result reaction, which was positive, uh, some private sector banks. But uh, on the whole, IT, which one thought would uh, stand in good stead, uh, did not help much. Uh, the global growth, especially US growth slowdown fears, probably hurt that segment as well. And uh, therefore, we had really few winners. Other than private banks, there wasn't much to speak about. Uh, anything else that stood out for you, stock-wise? Well, in terms of stocks, definitely it was a whole medley of stocks uh, from the frontline space which declined. So, for example, pharmaceutical was lower. Sun Pharma was down around 3-odd percent. We had Wipro, which was down from the IT space, and something like a TCS, which declined. Result reactions included Asian Paints, RBL Bank, and TVS Motors. So, all these stocks stood out in terms of result reactions. And in terms of gain, India Bulls Housing Finance was quite resilient. We also had Indusind Bank, which was bouncing back from yesterday. And Yes Bank, which comes out with numbers this week, that too was in focus. Broader market losers included something like Biocon, which was quite weak, Hexaware ahead of its numbers, and a couple of others such as Berger and Kansai Nerolak. Yeah, it was not a good day for pharma stocks yeah. and IT stocks and, of course, paint stocks. But uh, uh, something's painting the world red. And on that note, let's invite our guest, Richard Harris of Port Shelter Investment Management, uh, joins us. Uh, good evening, Richard. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. Well, uh, repeated uh, rounds of risk aversion globally. Uh, do you think we are going to see more of it? And will EMs bear the brunt? Well, I think we, we just need to sort of step back a second and have a look and see what's happening. You know, the, 
early part of the year when the, we had the crash in February, pretty well every analyst on Earth said that we were going to have a period of volatility. Um, so we shouldn't be too terribly surprised if we're in a period of volatility at the moment. Uh, we have seen markets down today. Don't forget that many of the Asian markets um, were up quite substantially yesterday. I'm thinking of China pretty well yes. 5%. Yes, it's down 2 three, two to 3% today, you know, so it's up 2, down 1. Um, and I don't think we should be terribly surprised that we're seeing that at the moment. Mm. You, know, you know, the underlying economies are still quite strong. And um, certainly in the U.S., and they're not too bad in, in Europe, uh, valuations in Europe and uh, in the emerging markets are not bad at all. Mm. Um, and I think at the moment we basically have to sit on our hands and just say, yes, it's a volatile period, um, but we're just going to have to live through it. Mm. Richard, hi. Evening. Um, what is your sense in terms of how much this geopolitical issue between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, and maybe even Europe and Saudi Arabia at this point, could escalate because of uh, the alleged killing of uh, the Saudi journalist in Turkey? Well, there's no doubt that um, it, it's a tragic situation. But I think that, you know, the, there are factors that are much bigger than this. Mm. this. This is a difficult situation. It's been deeply embarrassing for Saudi Arabia to have to wheel the elderly king out to uh, explain things, you know, is, is a difficult question for Saudi Arabia. I think they will be chastened by it. Um, I think the world uh, obviously has made its uh, displeasure known. Um, but uh, clearly Saudi Arabia is in a very important position as the swing pumper and in fact almost as the global um, oil price um, uh, controller in, mm. in some ways. So I think that things will probably get back to normal uh, before too long. But clearly um, the Saudi authorities are out on some judges now, so they're okay. going to have to keep uh, their noses clean for a while. All right. So the uh, journalists uh, killing tragic, but for the markets, uh, they will move on. And you're not terribly worried about growth either, Richard. What about Indian markets? Uh, they've fallen a goodish bit uh, from their recent highs of 11,800. The Nifty is now trading at 10,100. So there's been uh, a, f a, big, a, a decent amount of fall, almost 14 percent from recent highs. Are they cheap enough for foreigners to come in, or do you think uh, Indian markets will still be shunned? I think that the, the emerging markets will, as foreigners tend to look at them as one block uh, initially when they come back in. Uh, and it's also been some of the emerging markets like Turkey, uh, like Venezuela, like Argentina have not done it all well this year. But I do think that we will see investors come back in. Don't forget, in terms of the Indian market, not only has the market gone down, but so is the currency. So uh, those assets are looking quite cheap. But we will need a slight, we'll need a reduction in the volatility, and we will need to have a little bit more of a sustained risk on sense before I, I think investors start going back in 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 size. Hmm. Richard, currently Brent is at $78.3 per barrel as we speak and have this conversation. What's your sense in terms of, say, a range that we could see and uh, how much lower do you think that it could probably go if that's your forecast? Well, I think around this level, you know, 75.80 is probably about where it should be. You know, we are in the more expensive phase of year when um, uh, the northern hemispheres start to um, uh, tank up for the winter. Um, but uh, the oil price is subject to some quite big moves in either direction, you know, possible supply restrictions coming out of places like Iran and Venezuela, uh, but equally so the fact that maybe China is slowing a bit, so there'll be less demand as well. I think that the 75-80 level looks to me like a steady state. It's already risen pretty well uh, from 50 to 80 this year, so that's a substantial move. Okay. Um, to move up to 100, I think, would be bold. It would take uh, maybe some more geopolitical issues, uh, mm -hmm. but I think not, not really. So I think we're pretty well looking at the steady state of this level. Okay, that suits uh, India as a big importer, so long as it doesn't go towards 100 or even 90. Uh, but Richard, a final question to you. Uh, when you look at India, have you only looked at it as a product of the global ebb and flow of foreign funds, 
or are you particularly worried about what we have been worrying uh, uh, an illiquidity in the debt market and possible problems for non-bank finance companies well i think india has its its problems you know economically like everybody else but uh, you, you know, a, a, a burgeoning debt problem and, and maybe some slowing here or there, uh, but also growth in other parts of the economy is something that most economies are suffering at the moment. You know, there's, there's no glowing picture anywhere. Um, I think, of course, India is going to suffer in terms of being in the emerging markets bucket. And I'd mentioned a, a couple of countries earlier that have had bad times this year, and that tends to pull it down. China has been weak, of course. Um, but I don't see India as, as, as being, you, you know, at the back of the pack. If anything, in terms of emerging markets, I'd, I'd see it near the front. You know, it has its problems to work through, but it's also um, a, an economy that, that keeps trucking along. And as mm. I said a moment ago, valuations don't look too bad, certainly compared to what they were. And uh, the currency makes a big yeah. difference to foreign investors. So I think that probably we're, we're in the right side of the buying bias at the okay. moment. All right. Uh, good to hear that, Richard Harris. Thank you very much for joining us. So key takeaways, uh, uh, while there is a risk of uh, the Indian markets uh, will not be at the bottom of the pack. Uh, they will, the growth is expected to chug along and with a cheaper valuation, lower valuations and a cheaper currency. Uh, sometime la uh, later when the FIs start looking at EM markets, India should be at the front of the pack. We'll take a break on that note. But uh, we, are have to, we have to go through the remaining headlines from Dalal Street. We will be also uh, helped by Sanjeev Basin and Mitesh Tucker who will join in to answer all your questions. So, we are back at the Jiffy. Welcome back. Well, you're still with us on Markets Today Talk Back. Before we left, we spoke to Richard Harris on the Global Growth Scare and its impact on the markets. Let's now look at all of the other top headlines that we're tracking. Private sector bank stocks saw a lot of buying today as investors flew to safety. The stocks outperformed in trade. Yes, Axis, Kotak, Indusin, all of these stocks ended in the green. Although Indusin rose after some clarifications came in from Ramesh Sopti on the bank's exposure to debt laid in Island FS. He said that the bank has taken total provisions of 350 crores on Island FS and resolution will bring in definitive cash flows. Listen in. We didn't disclose the exposure and I think that uh, the only reason that uh, we held that back is that the fact that there is a resolution plan which will actually uh, detail out and bring out what the impact is going to be on the lenders. The lenders to the uh, the holding company and the lenders to the SPVs. Okay, that's Ramesh Sopti uh, explaining why he didn't mention the bank's exposure to ILNFS. Uh, but uh, remember, the bank has taken a 275 crore rupee provision in the second quarter. The numbers were otherwise uh, quite okay. And uh, after the uh, explanation on CNBC TV18, the stock recovered. I think we have a question on that stock uh, and we can invite our guests to take them, Mitesh and Sanjeev. Uh, the question has come from M. Chandra from Gujarat. Uh, he has written uh, and uh, about uh, Indescent. He's, he wants to know what is the long-term future of the stock. Okay, looks like he wants to know whether he should buy it for the long term. Uh, Sanjeev, I think since it's long term, uh, let me invite you first. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, how would you answer, Chandra? Surely, either buy it outright or do a sip because even though the stock is touching new lows, I think it has been one of the pedigree stocks in the retail side and uh, given that uh, the, they've guided that the commercial vehicle side is uh, even now showing a lot of traction. So we know the two, uh, two uh, problems which we've had, one was ILFS and some, second was a slowdown because of the insurance tax and so on on uh, some of the uh, vehicle finances. But uh, the, the management is very prudent, they've indicated, they've already taken a provisioning which no other bank has done and I think uh, this correction should be a buying opportunity. Over a period of next two years, I don't rule out a 30% upside in this stock uh, given that it's a pedigree management and it has always performed quarter on quarter for the last, I, I don't know how many, 30 quarters or so. Okay. Well, point taken. Uh, Chandra should be happy with that advice. Now, before I go to the third headline, Mitesh, we missed asking you about the markets in general. Uh, we saw that 10,150 coming in as a fairly important support zone. Uh, we have ended at 10,146, just a little south of it. Uh, do you think this holds or uh, do you think it's uh, just a day's defense and we still are more likely to go lower? 
This area is uh, filled with multiple support zones. This 10,125 and then 10,995. So I think all these three levels are important areas. But the long-term charts, uh, and I've been saying this as much for the last few weeks, have weakened significantly. So while they might hold for short term, which is basically about a couple of weeks, and anywhere between this 100-150 point range, you might find another short-term bottom. But I think eventually we'll break below it. So the idea is that for the time being, it is not a, the the best uh, you know levels to possibly be trading aggressively on the short side. Maybe closer to pullbacks on medium-term basis, 10,600-700 is the best zone to go short. But I think eventually we will break below these levels and head towards levels closer to about 96-50 to about 9,500. Okay, all right. Uh, so now let's get to the third headline for the day. The entire paint sector lost color in trade today, and the losses were led by Kansai Nerulak and Asian Paints, both of which reported lackluster numbers for the quarter ended September. Berger Paints too fell close to 5% today. In fact, Asian Paints KBS Anand underlined the factors that led to a reduction in their top line growth. Let's listen in. Rising crude prices and the depreciating rupee have added to the challenging business environment. We will need to monitor the impact of demand conditions given the less than forecasted rainfall in the monsoon season, as well as uncertainties arising from a busy election period. At the same time, we expect the raw material prices to rise further in the ongoing quarter. ESP reduction was announced to liquidate stocks because uh, we had to undertake Restickering of some 170,000 kL of stock. So we, we ease this process to complete the exercise within a short span of time by giving a fairly substantial rebate to liquidated stock. This reduced top line automatically. Okay, so it's a one-off to some extent, says KBS Anand, uh, the head of Asian Paints. Uh, let's get some questioners on this issue. Shiv Kumar. Uh, has 136 shares of Asian paints, which he purchased at 980 rupees a piece. Wants to know the five-year outlook for the company, and of course, he's still in the money. But uh, Sanjeev, uh, should he accumulate at this juncture? Should he book some profit? Well, I would say use this decline to buy. Most of the bad news is in the price. There was a one-off because of the destocking for GST. Crude, crude prices have been another, uh, you know, problem point because they increase the input cost. But Lata, 63% of the decorative segment and growing. Thirdly, we know that uh, once the, uh, you know, the festive season plays out, you'll see more consumption coming, more uh, house building and so on. And I think that uh, that should augur well for uh, the largest paint player in the world, in, in the country. Uh, pedigree stock, I think uh, this is a, you know, these 1100, 1150 levels are very, very good levels to get in. I don't rule out a, you know, a retest of 1600 in the next one and a half years. Given that once the elections are over, you should see more political stability and a huge uh, pullback in uh, the housing sector with demand again seeing uh, most of the paint sector do extremely well. Okay, well, Mitesh, what would you recommend in terms of the weakness that we've seen for Asian paints? Would it be a buying opportunity? See, uh, I think, you know, Asian paints, again, a very similar setup to what I've been talking about the indices. I think the uh, medium-term outlook is uh, definitely kind of... Uh, uh, turned weak. But what can happen is that in the short term, if you see the stock price is corrected a lot and I think it's, uh, you know, uh, now coming very close to its uh, medium term support zone of around 11, 15, 11, uh, 10. Uh, eventually, I think it will break, but for the time being, I do expect from these levels, the decline could be halted and we could see a relief rally about levels of 12, 40, 50. But I think serious buying should be considered slightly at lower levels, closer to about 1000, I think that's which is where the longer term or the monthly supports kick in. Okay, so uh, caution over Asian paints. Let's get to the fourth headline. A flat rupee sent pharma and tech stocks downwards. Both IT and pharma indices ended close to three percentage points in the red, led by heavyweights like Sun Pharma, Lupin, Wipro and Infosys in the case of IT stocks. Okay, well, we have a query now. Rajiv uh, has uh, written to us from Mumbai and he has a question on Sun Pharma. He's been holding 69 shares of the company at 509 rupees per piece. He's a long-term investor, wants to know if he should hold or sell. Uh, Sanjeev, what would you recommend? There was weakness on Sun today, but um, uh, overall, say, uh, from a longer-term perspective? So, Ekta, I think the pharma sector has uh, definitely bottomed out. There was a lot of weakness in the last one and a half, two years. 
but given that halol has uh, has been uh, the halol resolution has been done there there are new product launches we think generic prices should be up and kicking and we expect results to be uh, better than estimated so we think that pharma becomes a very good proxy to a weak rupee and aside from that you know the inherent business of being a slight defensive will play out now when the times are slightly uncertain globally so i would definitely think that sun pharma should be held i would re i don't rule out a target of 750 by the end of next year okay uh, with that uh, let's come to the last headline of the day and uh, that's about today's earnings among financial companies bajaj finance recovered 4% from the day's lows but still ended in the red after the company reported a better than expected set of numbers strong growth momentum uh, did of course help this recovery so it did for rbl bank that stock closed a percent in the red and that again was despite very strong growth in the company's balance sheet which means its loan book uh, the uh, details are available with abhishek kothari who has just joined us uh, abhishek tell us about both these stocks and their numbers The balance sheet growth for uh, Bajaj Finance continued to remain strong. Their loan book increasing by 38% on a YY basis. So over the last five to six quarters, the AUM growth has been in the region of 35 to 40%. This growth was largely driven by the consumer and the rural portfolio. The calculated net interest margin came down by 16 basis point, but remained healthy at 10.9%. There was a slight hiccup in the asset quality as gross NPA uh, increased marginally by 10 basis point to 1.49 versus 1.39 in the. previous quarter however the profit came in at 923 crore versus our poll of 840 crore in terms of rvl bank the balance sheet growth remained robust the loan book grew by 36 and a half percent which drove the net interest margin to an all time high of 4.08 percent there has been 70 basis point increase in the net interest margin over the last eight quarters but that has not resulted in terms of the return ratios improving so return on asset has improved only 25 to 26 uh, basis point over the last eight quarters while roe has remained in the region of 10 to 13 basis point uh, the negative worry being the slippage is remaining elevated at 142 crore versus 148 crore in the previous quarter the gross npa in absolute value increased by 8% quarter on quarter however as a ratio it remained flat at 1.4% sequentially back to you lot for that abhishek uh, well uh, uh, sanjeev uh, i have a question so i'll supplant the viewers questions Uh, what do you make of both bajaj finance and rbl uh, bajaj finance is still expensive uh, but blockbuster numbers over 50% growth would you buy the stock now definitely uh, lata i think the the pessimism and fear on liquidity is overdone bajaj finance has indicated excellent numbers and uh, yes there will be a little bit of more provisioning which the market did not like because generally provisionings have never been the game plan for uh, bajaj finance but you know lata i think both the numbers from them and rbl bank truly have uh, t- are telling us that pessimism is definitely overdone in the nbfc space i think uh, these are definitely qualify as very good buys at 2000 rupees you can't go wrong on bajaj finance i'd also like to add you know the other two numbers tvs motor and hcl from different sectors even they were a very big beat on the numbers and the pessimism on two wheelers is also seeming to be overdone so we think these four numbers today were the highlight of the best numbers in the result season till now Okay, all right. Uh, but let's uh, focus on a couple of numbers then. Amongst the auto companies, it was TVS Motors which beat expectations with the second quarter numbers. Revenue rose nearly 22 percent. Margins expanded nine, by 90 basis points. This is while profits came in at just over 210 crores, almost in line with estimates. The management is confident of sustaining the growth momentum and hopes to outperform the industry as well. Uh, Narayan T from Pune has written to us with a query on TVS. He wants to invest one lakh rupees for the long term. Wants to know the right time to enter the market. I know it's a long term query, but in any case, Mitesh, what would your um, view be on TVS Motors if one had to invest one lakh right now at current levels? Yeah, so I think you know uh, the stock has corrected from levels of around 765 to about uh, 470, 480, and there's good support closer to about levels of 430. So I think uh, you know uh, we can start uh, accumulating slowly, and if there's another uh, five to ten percent kind of dip, add more, and that should be and keep a stop below 430. I don't think that level will be broken, and eventually I think we should see some kind of a reversal here and look at a price target of around 650 plus, given a 12 month kind of a time horizon. Okay, let's stick with results. Actually, 
IT major HCL Technologies report its second quarter numbers. And let's straight away go to Reema, who is here with the highlights. Well, it's an absolutely in-line set of numbers by HCL Technology. So a no surprise this quarter. Dollar revenue growth 2.1%, constant currency growth 3%, which means it falls short of its larger peers like Infi and TCS. EBIT margins have come in uh, higher by 30 basis points. Um, so that two-month wage hike would have eaten into the INR depreciation benefit. Profits have gone up by 5.7%. Uh, there, uh, it's actually slightly higher than expectations. On the F519 guidance, that's been maintained, but that was what was expected as well. So constant currency growth stays at 9.5% to 11.5%, uh, which would include the organic guidance of 4.25% to 6.25%, and EBIT margin guidance stays at 19.5% to 20.5%. BFSI has been a bit subdued for the company. It's just a growth of 0.1%. Europe has seen a decline for the second straight quarter, and infrastructure management services, which slowed down significantly, uh, has seen some pickup, so 2.5% percent growth in this time but it's still slower than the company average but all in all in line numbers Mitesh, uh, sorry uh, Sanjeev I'm borrowing from the next show but in 10 seconds if you can tell me buy sell hold HCL tech well, definitely a buy. I think at this price, HCL Tech has a definite will give you at least a 25% upside. The numbers were a beat from my side. All right. Uh, sorry, gentlemen, out of time. Thank you very much for joining us, Mitesh and Sanjeev, and taking questions from our viewers. We wrap up this edition of Markets Today. Talk back on that note.